Well, it says it's time for us to begin, and I heard the buzzer, so we're going to go ahead and get started tonight and invite you back over to the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 9 this evening. And we're going to try to finish up our study on the 10 miracles in Matthew 8 and 9 this evening. And uh, next week, Lord willing, we'll be picking up uh, with another, I guess you might say, emphasis in Matthew. But tonight we want to try to take a look at the verses starting at about verse 27 and going down to about verse 34 there. And that's what uh, we'll try to take a look at for tonight. Uh, but before we get started, uh, we do want to uh, take a moment to, to have prayer together and try to remember uh, some of those on our prayer list that are uh, on our hearts and minds this evening. And I'm sure there are probably some that some would like to make mention of and would also like to give you a little bit of an update on Cheryl's dad and let you know that uh, he had a, he actually had two appointments today, uh, but he met with oncology this morning and um, he's not going to, to do any uh, chemo or uh, radiation. They're just too hard on his condition. He's got a, a heart condition on top of other things, and so that's out. Uh, but they do uh, have an immunotherapy approach that they're going to try to do, uh, and that's trying to be set up now. Uh, in fact, his first treatment on that is supposed to be a week from today. Uh, and so they're... They're trying to get all that uh, situated and all, and he um, he appreciates very much everybody's prayers up here, but he wants to stay at home, and so he's at this point right now he's going to stay home. It looks like, and unless we can twist his arm somehow and get him to come, which we want him to, um, and, but we want to continue to remember him in prayer if we can, and and all that's going on there. And I know there are uh, some others that uh, we want to give some updates on, and, and all, Charlie? No, she does not. Really? My goodness. Let's remember Sister Mary Ann uh, this evening, and, and remember her in our prayers. Is How's Jordan and Casey and little Charlie?
Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Well, let's keep them in our prayer too. Uh, okay. Uh, Phil. Remember Colson? He got COVID. Colson does. Oh yeah. Well, what about Elizabeth? I don't think she does. Not yet. Okay. All right. Someone else maybe know of another to mention along that line or with something else to bring up? Okay. All right, let's, let's have Wally and Barbara. I know Dennis and, and Donna are dealing with uh, the virus, and I think MC is too, if I remember correctly. I lose track of everybody that way sometimes. Uh, okay. Anyone else maybe know of another to mention for tonight? Uh, how about, yes sir? Our uh, daughter and granddaughter are flying in tomorrow from Washington State. Uh, I'd like to have them in our prayers for a safe travel. Okay, they're going to get to stay for a little while, I hope. Yeah, a little over a week. Okay, all right. Well, that's good news for a visit like that. And some other good news I think we, we ought to put in our prayer list tonight is, uh, is Tyler and Emily are here as, as husband and wife uh, tonight. And we're grateful for that. And I, I, think, uh, I think there's another announcement similar to that, getting close to that. Wendy, tell me what's going on. Tell everybody that is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's let's uh, keep uh, Grant and Shelby in our prayers this evening. Uh, anybody else maybe have something you want to to add to our prayer list for tonight? <coughs> okay, all right. Well, let's take a minute, if we could, to to begin our class with a prayer, and then we'll try to take a look at our. Our study for this evening out of Matthew 9. If you would, let's bow together for just a moment, please. Almighty God and Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for the life that you've given us to live here and the day that you've blessed us with. And we're mindful, Heavenly Father, of, of being able to, to look about us and see so many wonderful things to be thankful for and, and know that, that even in the difficult things that we can come to you in prayer. And we're mindful tonight, Father, and are thankful for uh, Shelby and Grant and their engagement. We pray that you would bless them as they move forward with their decision to get married. And we're grateful, Father, for, for Tyler, and we're grateful, Heavenly Father, for Emily and the commitment they've made to one another. And we pray that you would bless them in their married life, that you would watch over them in the days that lie ahead. And we're mindful, Heavenly Father, too, of, of others like uh, Kaylin, and she's getting married, and we're thankful for that, and we pray that you would watch over her and the marriage that will be taking place here in the very near future. We pray, Lord, that as we go down through our lives today, that, that we might recognize that along with the, the good things that come our way, sometimes things are hard for us, and, and we ask, Lord, for your strength and help to get through those things. Uh, we pray, Father, that you'd be with Wally and Barbara, that you'd be with MC and, and Donna and Dennis. We pray that you'd be with uh, Jordan and Casey and little Charlie and Marianne and Colson. And we pray that you'd help them as they uh, try to combat the, the COVID that they have and be able to get back to us soon. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would also be with uh, the Marcel's daughter as she travels and the granddaughter, that they would have a safe journey here and, a, and an enjoyable visit. 
And we ask, Father, that you be with Cheryl's dad and that you would watch over him, help him in the things that they're working through to, to get things in a good way for him. And we pray, Father, for success and the treatments that they have lined up there. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would be with each of us and, and help us to know that you're near our side no matter where we are in the world or whatever is happening in our lives. And may we depend upon you, Lord, for everything that we need and everything that, that is important to us. Forgive us, we pray, where we sin and fall before you and help us to get back up and to try harder to, to walk in the light as your son left us that example. For it is in Jesus' name that we do pray. Amen. <clears throat> Well, if you'd like to open up to Matthew chapter 9, we want to start there at uh, verse 27. And we're going to take a look at two different miracles this evening. One of which, the second one, is one that we've already uh, visited a little bit before in this study uh, in Matthew chapter 8. It's about uh, casting out demons and so forth. And we've looked at, at an example of that already. And we are going to start, though, with the first miracle that Matthew records of Jesus healing the blind. Uh, in particular here, it's two uh, blind men uh, that are going to be healed. And we start reading about that in verse 27, and we come down to about verse 31. So let's take a moment just to read the passage together and to take a look at what is, is recorded here for us. It says, as Jesus went on from there, Two blind men followed him, crying out, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came up to him. And Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, It shall be done to you according to your faith. And, he, and their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them, see that no one knows about this. But they went out and spread the news about him throughout all the land. So let's take a look at these two individuals that we find that are, are, are blind men uh, who uh, encounter Jesus as Jesus is moving from one spot to the other. And in the process of that, uh, they are able to cry out to him uh, for his help. And they say, uh, have mercy on us, son of David. Now, uh, in looking at that and their cry and what they do, let's begin by just thinking a little bit uh, about the idea and about the experience of some of those people and some people today who are in fact blind. Uh, when we look back in time and we go into the scriptures themselves, we would find there that there are many blind people that are made reference to. And we would also find uh, that they are a very vulnerable uh, category of people uh, because they can be taken advantage of. They can't hold a job of any sort. Uh, they are handicapped in a very uh, significant way. They may be uh, able to do other things as far as, you know, be able to, to uh, have strength in their bones and muscles and so forth, but their inability to see is a, a severe a handicap. Most of the time, uh, they're going to be just simply reduced to begging. And that's often where we would find them is begging, and that's likely uh, as we look at this what uh, these men were doing as well uh, who were sitting out and they saw or didn't see they understood Jesus was coming by but let's think for just a minute about the fact that blind people are oftentimes abused and you go back to the law of Moses you have laws given uh, in the law of Moses to protect blind people uh, you might ask, well, well, what are they? Well, one of them is, is uh, don't put a stumbling block in front of a blind person. Well, why would somebody do that? Why would you have to be told not to do that? You know, uh, but it just tells you something about the nature of people, does it not? Uh, and that's the pitiful thing about that. 
Uh, it's also said, you know, that you're not supposed to mislead a blind person and things along that line. But, so there are, uh, I guess you might say, um, uh, some directives given, laws given, to try to offer some protection uh, to, to the blind. But not always do people follow the law. Uh, we might remember the great patriarch Job. Uh, Job made the point of helping blind people. That's what it says in chapter 29, that he was eyes to the blind. Uh, that's what he was. Uh, well, that kind of tells us that he was interested in trying to assist and help those who were blind. If we were to ask um, how many different blind people have we ever met, what would we say? Uh, do we do we know very many people uh, that are blind? Can you think of maybe the maybe the first blind person you became aware of or that you ever saw or met? Uh, Leon? Uh huh. He's blind from birth. Okay. Okay. And he said there's one thing he could not do. And that was eat pot. He couldn't. <laughs> okay. He was, he was a church prize preacher. How about that? I knew of another uh, Church of Christ preacher, as you say, uh, who was in West Tennessee. And he spoke at the lectureship to Fred Hardeman for uh, many times. I, and it was remarkable what a, a tremendous job he could do and did do. Uh, anyone else maybe know someone or had an acquaintance or, or, or a friendship with someone that was blind? Or who was the first blind person you ever encountered? Can anybody? Scott? I work with a guy. He's, he's not totally blind, mm -hmm. but he is legally blind. Uh -huh. and David, uh, Beverly's brother. Yeah, he gets around fine. He does kind of like what Scott was saying. Doesn't he have like a computer that helps him? Yeah, but he can't. He has retinitis pigmentosis mm -hmm. along the macular degeneration. And he looks like he's looking through the end of a pen. Yeah. He don't see, he, he, he'll see a shot. Okay. He can walk by himself some, but like when I took him to a hockey game once, he had a hold on my arm the whole time because it was an unfamiliar area. Okay. But getting around his apartment, he does fine. And he's got a lady friend, a friend, mm -hmm. that lives next door to him in the complex, and she helps him out a lot. Okay. All right. Uh, anybody else, maybe? A GM? I was stationed in Morocco. Back in 1970, 71, I befriended uh, Sailor there, who was from Hmm. And uh, years later, he helped me move down here. Uh, his daddy was blind. And uh, became friends with him as well. But, uh, he used to work in Bainbridge as uh, part of the industry for the blind. They made mops and brooms and stuff like that. But now he's on the business end of it. He's selling mops and brooms. I would take him around everywhere and got off. And I didn't even know this town. I mean, I just moved here. But he knew it. He remembered every street, every bump in the road, every <laughs> railroad track, every little thing. He remembered. He memorized all of it. How about that? And he would tell me as I'm driving. He, and, I, and I would look over him when he was, and I said, are you sure you can't see? Because uh -huh. it's just. Yeah. But uh, he, was, he was something else. He called himself, his name was Jack, Jack Rampley. But everybody knew him as Happy Jack. And he was always happy. The blindness never made him miserable or anything. Or okay. Or anything like that. He, uh, he didn't enjoy being blind, but he, he didn't. He wasn't. 
but he was dealing with it in the best way he could. Okay, all right, okay. Uh, anybody else maybe think of someone, Gary? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm asking a question. Okay. Why did Jesus tell him not to tell people that he, that tell them, why did he tell them not to tell the people? That's a good question. <laughs> We're not exactly told, you know. It doesn't say why. No, it doesn't. Uh, and it's just, uh, you know, some people have suggested, well, maybe he was using reverse psychology. You know, don't go tell anybody when he really uh, kind of thought that would prod him into telling somebody. You know, I, but there's really not an explanation given there about that. Uh, it does bring up kind of a... a a quandary to think about a little bit. Uh, was Jesus serious when he said, don't go telling anybody? No, it could have been because he, it, it might have prevented him to be able to move around freely like, like he needed to. Mm -hmm. um, if, he was, if he could do that, that there might have been a lot, a lot of people from all over the known world at that time to come and, and, uh, and surround him. He couldn't do it anymore. He wasn't ready. His, his ministry was not finished yet. Okay, that's probably part of what was going on there. The fact is, is in both of these chapters, in chapter 8 and chapter 9, you have throngs of people who are, are pressing in. If you look back over in, in chapter 8, and look up there after uh, Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law at verse 16, it says, When the evening came, they brought many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out all the spirits, and he healed all that were ill. Uh, or they began flocking. Is that a normal? Would you say that that would be an, uh, an expected reaction? Uh, if we had seen something like that, would we flock to that too? Sure we would. Or we ought to. Uh, Brother Lewis? David, we find on many examples that he gave those stock instructions to people that he healed, but on other occasions he did not give those type instructions. So we we will know one day, yes. not today. And it's interesting that on another occasion, uh, he actually told the man called Legion to do what? Tell Go home and tell everybody what great things God's done for you. Uh, you know, and that was in Decapolis, over on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, so sometimes, the, as Brother Louis pointed out, it's one way, and another time it's another. Uh, but here, we're not really told, we're not told why here, like this. Well, we are told that he's built, that a lot of people is getting against him. The Pharisees and Sadducees are all trying to find something yes. to accuse him for to make him stop. And so the less publicity he gets right now, the better off he is than, you know, going. So I can understand if you see, like right on down, we'll be studying a little while, how they, they already looked at he's a, he's a devil. And so the more he did like that, yes. the more they were going to build that resistance. And he needed to wait. He needed that resistance to go away for a while and let him finish his work. You know, the... The, the picture that we get here of Jesus as he heals these two individuals, this, this miracle is a little bit different in some ways than others. And the fact is, is that these things were done um, to prove something, were they not? Miracles had a purpose behind them. To prove who he was. Yes, to prove who he was. And it was having that kind of effect here. Many people were becoming believers. And as Brother Hugh pointed out, uh, that lights the fire under the opposition, as, as we'll see when we get down here to this next miracle. Uh, but, but here, uh, we're taking a look here at chapter 9, and we see these two men, uh, they followed Jesus, they went into the house that he went into, uh, which kind of tells you something, uh, doesn't it, about how, how are they getting around like this? Yes, and have we not seen already other miracles where people were aiding the, I guess, the, the diseased and the sick and the afflicted? They were aiding them getting to Jesus. And uh, that seems to be something that was going on with these two gentlemen as well. Uh, what is it that 
that Jesus um, asks them. What does he ask them? Yes. Do you believe that I can do this? Uh, and what was their answer? Yes. 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 And then Jesus makes a, another statement here. Uh, and, and that this miracle is going to be uh, calibrated to the fact that it's going to be done according to what? Yes. <coughs> yes. Now, is, that the, is it the case that... Uh, that Jesus always depended upon the faith of other people before he could heal them? No. Uh, but he, he makes a point here with these two, you know, of them saying and stating their faith before other people. Did they really believe Jesus could do it? How do we know? Because they were healed. That's exactly right. He set the condition there. He did. Yes, he did. The other, a lot of other people, they got healed by somebody else's faith. The girl was dead. Yes. Her, she had a That's baby. right. She right. got healed by other people's faith. Right. Family. Right. Uh, you know, and, and you, we can look at a lot of examples on both sides of this, uh, but it's, it's, it's significant here. Do you think Jesus knew whether they believed or not? Sure he did. Sure he did. So him asking them, do you believe that I can do this, was to benefit who? Other people. The ones who were watching. The witnesses that were there. Uh, they believed in what Jesus... Uh, they were hearing people say that they, that they had faith that Jesus could heal these men. And so, you know, it was for the benefit of, of the listeners uh, who were around. Uh, the Lord knew uh, what their heart was. We see that repeated over and over again in the New Testament, that he knew what was in the heart of man. Uh, it wasn't information that he didn't have that, that he was trying to get from them. He was, this was a teaching moment, you might say, here, for those who were with him. Now, in looking at that, uh, it does confirm the fact that they did truly believe. Otherwise, as Brother, he pointed out, there wouldn't have been a miracle here. Uh, and uh, the, the eyes would still have been blind after this. Phil? Don't you think those men had heard of what Jesus had been doing? Yes. They, maybe they couldn't see it. But surely they could hear. Yes. You're not going to believe what he has done. I just, I just saw, him, and I'm telling you about this. So yes. They probably witnessed it, and you know, do they? Yes, they believe. Yes. But how much did they believe? Are they like the man that said, "Help my unbelief"? Yes. You know, <laughs> were, were they? Yeah, I think I, I believe you can do this, but you might want to help me. <laughs> you know, yes. Uh, all right, uh, and that's uh, Brother Jim. I think Jesus also healed sometimes on his own compassion. Yes. Uh, the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead. His sisters did not have the faith that Jesus could or would raise him from the dead. And obviously Lazarus didn't have the faith. He was dead. Right. So... Jesus had compassion and let that sway him yes. to do certain miracles. Can anybody think of another miracle that was uh, accredited to the person's faith? The woman of issue of blood. Yes. Yeah. Yes. She, she did what? She snuck up behind him and touched his garment and Jesus said, your faith has made you whole. Yes. Yes. That's another example, like like what we're looking at here, uh, that uh, led to the to a miracle occurring here. Uh, someone else, maybe uh, Brother Gore. Well, we're on the case of Lazarus, this is something I've always wondered. Is he the same Lazarus that was uh, in Abraham's bosom? No, I don't think so. No, sir, I don't think so. I think that was a different one. Uh, uh, but. Uh, but that is a name that, uh, you know, we have multiple people with multiple, uh, well, with the same name. Like how many different Jameses are there in the New Testament? There's a bunch of them. <laughs> a whole slew of them, as a matter of fact. 
How many Marys are there? You know, there's quite a few of them. Uh, and, uh, but I do, I do think that uh, the Lazarus, who's the brother of Mary and Martha, is a different person than, than the one that Jesus was talking about at the rich man's house. Uh, uh, but someone else maybe have a thought or a comment there. Uh, brother Gary, and then Q. The men that kept him, the men that brought them, the blind people to him, mm -hmm. they had to have faith too. Yes. Because uh, they had to have somebody to guide them. I say the men, whoever brought them. Right. Uh, they had to have faith too that this could be done. When we bring somebody to church with us, when we talk the gospel to them, we teach them, do we have faith that it's, they want to, we need to, we need to look at that when we try to teach I believe that the gospel is for them, and they're going to obey it. All right. Very good. Very good point. Legary and then uh, Brother Marcel. Certainly faith is important, but you know, a lot of times in the denominational world, particularly those who believe in miraculous healing today, mm -hmm. if someone's not <coughs> healed, then they'll say, well, that person yeah. didn't have enough faith. Yeah. But you see healings in the Bible, particularly people that were raised from the dead, right? where Jesus never questioned their faith, yet he performed a miracle, or arguably they didn't have any faith. Mm -hmm. You know, the, in the previous chapter, or uh, mm -hmm. the man that Jesus healed in, in, with the demons, you know? The demons had, they knew who Jesus was. Yes. <laughs> but the but, man was out of his mind. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. So, you have to show those examples. While that's certainly important, that's not the yes. required stipulation. <coughs> and, and that's important to keep in mind that this, it isn't that you could, uh, that Jesus wouldn't perform a miracle because he couldn't if this guy didn't have faith. It's just that it would have made a point that faith is important. And uh, and it is the case that you, you get mixed up with uh, Pentecostal type uh, folk and that, and you have people who say, well, it's that person's fault. Well, it's not that person's fault uh, in, in the same way that you're looking at this, I don't believe. Jesus himself can heal or perform any miracle regardless of what the people's faith is around him. Uh, here, it was a teaching lesson for somebody else to say, you know, he's become a believer in this man. He's become a believer in this man. And the others who helped him get there uh, are believers in this. Maybe I ought to be a believer in this man. That, that's where I think it's heading to here. Uh, Brother Marcel, do you want to add? Well, it also doesn't say anything, you know, uh, about how many people were there. Right. Uh, you know, in the house. But my comment, uh, I'm reading a book, and I'm not real sure about this or not, but according to another Hebrew book, the dead were not declared legally dead for three days <coughs> because according to this other uh, non-scripture book, the soul stays above the body until the body starts to decompose and then they are considered really dead whereas we as christians look at this miracle of jesus in comparison to jesus's uh stay in the tomb for three days so just throwing it out well, it's, uh, I've never come across that particular thing before, but uh, we do know that, does the Bible help us have a definition of death? Body yes, when the spirit leaves the body, the body is what? Dead. dead. It is dead. Now, we don't have a means by which that we can um, put an instrument of measurement or something like that to detect the moment the soul leaves the body. We, we have to deduce that uh, through other means. And uh, those uh, in the medical field have to wrestle with that sometimes. And, it's, uh, and that's something that when we, when we look at it, I, 
I don't think there's any biblical justification for saying you're three days dead and you're not really dead. <laughs> I don't think there's anything in there that says that at all. Uh, but there is a clear thing about <coughs> when the spirit leaves the body, it is dead. And when that happens, when, the, when Lazarus, the beggar, died, where did his spirit go? Yes, it returns to God who gave it. Uh, it doesn't linger somewhere in, in, a, in a no man's land kind of thing. I, I, I'm not sure where they came up with that theory, but that's, I don't think you can, I don't think we'll square that with, with what we know in Scripture. <laughs> that, it, it, that people have come up with a lot of different thoughts, that's for sure. Uh, Catholics are real big on that. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes, that is one of their doctrines. That's right. Purgatory is. Uh, Brother Gore? Well, let's look at the Lord. Uh, he died. Uh, but his spirit, I don't think, hovered over you know, three days. He was went to Hades like every, you know, yes. paradise side of Hades like all good people went. And he was down there I'm sure he was talking with Moses and Elijah. He probably, you know, because that's who he yes. was talking to uh, before he died. He yes. was probably saying something to him. Uh, I'll be down to see you later, you know, uh, <laughs> get crucified, you know. Yes. And I'm sure that Moses and Elijah remembered that. And they yes. would have been looking for him to appear and not stay up there hovering around in the tomb somewhere. And I believe he told somebody else he would see him in paradise uh, that day. Yeah. <laughs> this day. You will see. This yes. Day, yes. Day. Yes. Well, that, that's, that's a better answer right there. I, I should have thought of that too. Yeah. Well, that, well, that, well, that will work. Go ahead there, Brother Lou. I'm sorry. We reckon, I mean, the, we know that the soldiers on the cross of Calvary recognized that Jesus was dead. And that's the reason they didn't yes. break his legs. Yes. Uh, yes. So, yeah, I'm leaning a little bit opposite direction uh, the yeah. family theory but yeah. uh, we were talking about uh, blind blind folks over in John uh, this particular individual uh, didn't express any faith there to receive his sight the expression of faith, faith came as he was as he went to the pool of Siloam okay uh, I think, but prior to that, he didn't, there's, well, no, I, there's yeah. no indication that he had faith that Jesus could heal. It was a teaching moment for Jesus to show his disciples <laughs> that God had power over all. Yes. And especially in that particular case, uh, because he made the, you know, it, it tells him, it tells us there in, in verse three, uh, Neither this man nor his yes. anybody else sinned to cause him to be blind. It was so that the works of God uh, could be made manifest. Amen. Yes. And, uh, and then, of course, we know that the guy went on and washed and, and was seeing after that. Yes. Uh, uh, that's a that's a very important point to look at there too, on that. And it's it's a matter of uh, God Himself can do. Um, what he desires to do, and so can Jesus, and uh, and will. But this was a, a good time, Jesus deemed, to bring in the concept of faith and encourage people to be people of faith. And and there there were with that. Uh, and it's interesting that when we go to this next miracle here, the one about the Jesus casting out uh, demons, it starts there at verse thirty-two. It says, and they were going out, as they were going out, a mute, demon-possessed man was brought to him. After the demon was cast out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds were amazed, and were saying, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees were saying, he casts out demons by the ruler of demons. So these miracles were having a powerful impact on the people who witnessed them. However, did everybody believe? Absolutely not. No. If somebody says, well, if I saw a miracle today, I'd believe, is that necessarily so? No. Who didn't believe here? Pharisees. The Pharisees didn't. Leaders. Yes. 
the leaders of the Jews, the Pharisees, they were so adamantly against Christ uh, that they accused him of being in league with who? The devil himself, you know. Uh, and it's, it's interesting to me that they do not deny that the miracle occurred. They don't deny that the demons were cast out. What their objection is, is that they try to raise here, is why wife Beelzebub, or whomever they would like to name Satan as, he's the one who's empowered Jesus to do this. Now, if you talk about uh, uh, an important point here, now, even, even when uh, Peter and John healed the man at the gate in the temple, uh, you know, after Pentecost and so forth, the Sanhedrin, the high priest and all, could not deny the miracle had occurred. But they just didn't want anybody knowing about how they did it. And that's why they threatened them not to preach in the name of Jesus anymore. Uh, here, they can't deny this. What, what do you think would have been the reaction of the people if they had said, well, that didn't really happen? <laughs> yeah, they probably would have. They probably got run out of town on a radar, you know. Uh, you're the crazy ones now. Maybe the de demons went into you <laughs> kind of deal. Uh, Brother Gore. This brings up this uh, question of the impartment of sin. I've heard two versions of this. Maybe it's the same. One of them is it's a sin that's not repented of. But the other one that I think believe more is the one where you blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Yes. Know, which is what's being done here. He is, he is attributing, the Pharisees are attributing to, uh, to Satan that which God did. And that, that kind of blasphemy, and, and you have to see it. You have to actually visit. And these Pharisees saw it. Would that, would that consider maybe the important part of the sin? Would this constitute that? You know, I've never looked at it quite like that. Uh, I think the unforgivable sin is a sin that you don't repent of. That's for sure. Uh, to blaspheming, blaspheming against the Holy Spirit is something Jesus said was not forgivable. Uh, and how you um, apply that here, uh, it, I can see where that's coming into play here. Uh, I don't know if this exactly constitutes that or not. But uh, to attribute to Satan the work of God is, is blasphemy. And it does say, when Jesus spoke about blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, he does say blasphemy against me can be forgiven. He does say that blasphemy against God can be forgiven. And blasphemy, you can blaspheme people even. You know, you're, you can blaspheme each other. That can be forgiven. But he said the one thing that can't be is the Holy Spirit. is blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and while the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are uh, one in, in their work, they also are independent in a sense too. Uh, so I, I don't know if they would have quite crossed the line here because this was Jesus doing this, specifically him in this. Uh, look, Eric, go ahead. What I've always looked at that is there is no sin that cannot be forgiven mm -hmm. except a sin that someone is unwilling to repent of. That being said, if you look at the heart of the Pharisees, there's people even today that their conscience has gotten so seared. Yes. Okay? As in the case of the Pharisees, the gospel or the message of Christ at that time could not penetrate their heart in a spiritual sense. You know? So those people are going to be lost. Yes. I mean, there's people, that's the danger of living in sin for an extended period of time while it's possible to come back, people forget how to come back. Their conscience yes. is so seared, they're lost. Yes. You're not, you know, they're a psychopath, right? 
a sociopath. I mean, yes. You, you, you become numb to the fact that even uh, have I done anything wrong? That's exactly you, right. You know, they have no conscience. Yes, yes. Uh, and that's a, that is a very dangerous thing. It is significant, too, that John said that, that the sacrifice of Christ uh, was the propitiation for all the sins of the world, which I think feeds into the fact that the, the unforgivable one is, is something that you don't repent of because if you did, it could be forgiven. Yes. Well, let's pause there for this evening if we could and let everybody come on in. But appreciate it very much uh, everyone's help in, in class this evening. Good evening. If you don't like what I'm about to say, just remember the silver lining. I'm saving you from Brother Philip. Uh, so just keep that in mind. About a month or so ago, uh, I went to uh, up the landway. I convinced, the, oh, I fooled my son and daughter-in-law into letting me stay with the kids in the same, you know, structure. And uh, for about three or four days, that was, a, that was fun for them. Uh, but anyway, um, that Sunday, we went to, uh, I get them, I don't know why, I keep on, you say Norcross, it was Roswell. We went to the Roswell Church of Christ uh, Sunday morning, a small congregation, 
evidently they had a guest speaker and he his message was pretty good i mean i, I it really kind of resonated with me a little bit <clears throat> and kind of i'm, I'm going to I'm not going to emulate him, but I'm going to I'm going to steal some of the ideas that he was sharing. When I was probably uh, seven or eight years old, I, I lived in Kennett, Missouri, and <clears throat> there were some people there, and a lot of y'all may even know know them. Uh, Rosemary and Russ Burcham, they are pillars of that community. They're uh, strong. They were strong Christians. Their sons. Uh, uh, he was a, Russ was a dentist and um, had a son named Brett and Brett was a little bit older than me but he kind of kind of took me under his wing you know and plus I, I was a little taller than the normal uh, seven eight years eight year old so I kind of you know I looked his age I was far from it but anyway they they had a they were members of the church there, and I was living at the home, and I don't know how it happened, but they took all of us kids to this lake. And um, Russ, he, like I said, he's a pillar. He was an elder, just a great man. But um, I didn't know how to swim. And so... He knew that, and so we get to this lake, his lake house, whatever they got, and he, he says, Robert, you and Britt come on out, out to the dock with me. We're going to go out here to the lake. Okay. So I knew, I, I was seven or eight, I knew I needed a life jacket, but he said, don't, don't worry about that, be all right. I didn't know how to swim. Of course, I really wasn't scared. I was in a boat, and I was holding on. Well, of course, Britt, he could swim like a fish. Well, we get he paddle out there a little bit, and we're in a little John boat, and Britt jumps in the water. And I'm sitting there looking at Britt. All of a sudden, Russ just picks me up and throws me in the water. And that's how I learned to swim. I mean, and that's that, some people would say, all oh, that, that happened. That happened more, not just me, kids. Mm -mm. We didn't have no swimming lessons. That was it. But then um, another thing happened. Let me get my glasses on because I can't see. As I well as as you know, I learned how to swim and got better. We'd go there often. But as I got a little bit older, there was a a rock that jutted out from the into the water, and everybody it was kind of up there. And all the big guys and girls, you know, they jump in the water. They jump off this little cliff. Um, and they knew it was safe because it jutted out in the water. It's deep enough. But we were told not to do that, me and Britt. But, of course, boys being boys, we, we did that. We, we wanted to do that, and it was real scary. I mean, the first time I got up there, I just couldn't do it. But the second time I decided I'm going to do it, and I just closed my eyes and jumped. And it kind of leads me to these two things that happen right there. Number one, there's, there's uh, two types of challenges, okay? There's the challenge that just happens, you know, like a sickness, you know, trying to overcome that. You, you, it's a challenge, when Russ threw me in the water, I didn't want that challenge, but it was there, and I had to sink or swim, okay? But the challenge I want to talk to you about tonight is not that topic, the one that we kind of don't have any control over. These are the challenges that we have control over, that we decide to take on, okay? And... If you look at your if you look at your life and look look at some of the things you've done, there are challenges that we've accepted, boy, and they sure are dumb ones. They're they're just dumb. For example, just not too long ago they had that that chip challenge. You know what I'm talking about? The hot chip, and you and you eat it, 
and, and you, you can't drink anything and you're just exploding. I couldn't do it, I'll tell you that. I'd be crying. But, I mean, people just doing that, knowing what's going to happen to their stomach, their, their mind. I mean, there's sweat everywhere. But they're doing it. Then you had the ice bucket challenge. Oh, yeah, everybody did that. We're quick to take those kind of challenges. You know, God gives us challenges. He gives us challenges every day. But the good thing about God's challenges is there's no bad ending ever to God's challenge to each one of us. No matter what you do, when you're accepting God's challenge, you cannot do wrong. That's what he's saying. He's giving you so many outs if you mess up. But what challenge are you accepting? You know, we look at this congregation. I've been here a while. And when I'm talking, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. Our numbers are not what they used to be. My next door neighbor is not a member of the Church of Christ. Okay? My next door neighbor is not familiar enough with God to be saved. What about your neighbor? What about the people across the street from you? You kids right here that are, that are especially that are Christians. Over at that school, not everybody over that school is a member of the Church of Christ. How many challenges... Does God have to put before us? And you know what's funny? It's the same, some of the, it's really the same challenges every day. He gave it to the disciples. He gave it to the apostles. He gave it to the churches. And he gave it to us. Going to all the world. Did he not? And we can't sit here on our laurels and expect these pews to fill up once again. And again, I'm preaching to myself. That message of that, that man delivered, it, it kind of resonated with me because... I know I'm not doing what I should be doing. I haven't talked to that neighbor enough. One time and quit. That's, that's not accepting any challenge. And as a Christian, as we become a Christian, and we accepted, we accepted a lot when we said, I believe, and I'm baptized. We... We don't have to say it, but by our actions, we're, we're telling God we accept the challenge of being a Christian. And part of being a Christian is to spread the gospel. Not through the elders, even though that could be done, but it's, it's an indi individual thing. When's the last time that you talked to anyone about, hey, well, I pick you up Sunday morning. Come on to church. Just get them here. See what happens. If you're a Christian and you haven't completed God's challenge or working toward God's challenge, you've kind of fallen away. We all make mistakes. If it's something public, you need to come forward and confess that. If it's something private, sit right there while I'm talking and you can ask God to forgive you and he, he, he will. If you're not a Christian, the great thing about the challenge of becoming a Christian is it's really not a challenge at all. There's a door 
right dead in front of you, wide open. All you have to do is step across it. And believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Believe that he died for your sins. Repent of those sins. Confess his name and be baptized. And then live a steadfast life. If you're subject to the invitation at all, we come now as we stand and sing. All things are ready. Come to the feast. Come for the table now is spread. Ye famishing, ye weary, come. And thou shalt be richly fed. Hear the invitation. Come who so ever will. Praise God for full salvation. For who so ever will. All things are ready. Come to the feast. Leave every care and worldly strife. Come feast upon the love of God and drink everlasting life. Hear the invitation. Come who so ever will. Praise God for full salvation. For who so ever will. Please be seated. Thank you, Robert. It's a well needed message. The announcements for this evening uh, COVID listing uh, Cindy Copeland, who goes to, uh, to attends at Central Church of Christ, MC McLeod, Dennis Harvey, Jordan Casey, and Charlie Green, Colson Guthrie, and I'm certain there are others that are just not listed. Uh, please continue to remember your prayers, Chris Bundrick, because he's dealing with some health issues. John Peterson, who grew up at Raintree Village and attended Asher Sum, is having surgery on the 27th and has to be remembered in prayers. And Ralph Martin. There are many others that are listed in the bulletin and the worship folders. Wedding congratulations to Tyler and Emily Coppage. They were married this past Sunday in North Georgia. Engagement congratulations to Grant Colson and Shelby Joyner. Also, remember the Jenkins families that are preparing to make their move to start working with our congregation. Are there any, any announcements I may have missed? closing song will be I stand in awe I invite you to stand as we sing this and we'll sing it through once and I'll dismiss this in prayer you are beautiful beyond description to
kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day that you have blessed us with. We thank you for the time we have had to come together tonight to study a portion of your word. Father, we have many on our hearts and minds who are uh, sick and in need of your care and comfort. We pray that you'll be with each of them as you uh, know their needs. Father, we pray that you'll be with us as a congregation, as, as members of your body, to be those who will accept the challenge to go out into all the world and, and to reach out to those who are, who are nearby. Father, help us to be those who would be eager and willing to, to share your gospel and good news with, with the world, knowing that it is their only hope of salvation. We thank you for your love and your mercy. We pray that we will, you give us the courage and the strength to live for you. It's in your sons and we pray. Amen.